Uh, good, morning. good morning. We could not have asked for a much better morning to be outside and worship today. I know it's a little sunny. Some of you got umbrellas, good idea. Some of you got hats. Some of you are sitting in the shade of your tailgate. Some of you move the shade a little closer. And some of you are just enjoying the warm sunshine on a cool morning. Uh, however we've gathered, whether you're at home, whether you're here in the parking lot with us, we're glad to be together as a body of Christ. We're grateful that we can connect in person and uh, through social media. Uh, today we're going to celebrate communion. And uh, all of you, if you haven't already, make sure you grab your communion cups. We'll do the communion liturgy during service, but you guys won't have to come up. Uh, and then we'll explain a little bit more about that when we get to communion. Uh, this morning, however, our call to worship is uh, something special. It comes from the, our book of worship, but it's actually quoted from the book of common prayer. So I'll read it, and then we'll open the service in prayer. O wisdom on high, by you the meek are guided in judgment, and light rises up in darkness for the godly. Grant us in all doubts and uncertainties the grace to ask what you would have us do, that we may be saved from all false choices, and that in your light we may see light, and in your straight path we may not stumble through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, you've given us a beautiful, cool morning for us to gather outdoor. We get to celebrate your goodness. We get to worship in your creation. We get to connect with one another and with you in a special way this morning. We ask that you be here by your Holy Spirit. We might not be in a sanctuary, but this parking lot now has become a sanctuary for us. And for those who are in little sanctuaries, wherever they're listening, we ask that your presence be made known, that you would guide our worship this morning, that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, and that your word would penetrate our heart and our mind, and that today we would leave here as empowered, changed people, excited about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and on fire to share it and give it away. Do that great work in us, Father. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Our first hymn this morning, if you want to grab your hymnal, is number 133. Number 133, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We'll sing one, two, and three. And I'll sidestep the camera a little bit because I... Uh, will not be singing because I'm going to be live the whole time. So uh, I'll ask uh, Mark and Diane to, to kick us off and then you all can join in. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting heart. Oh, what a Everlasting arms, I have 
Amen. And that's the best thing we can do is lean on the everlasting love of Christ and uh, His strength. And we're going to move the offering. Many of you know, and if you, this is the first time you've been with us online, uh, one of the things that this church has done is caught the vision that, that when we collect an offering, it's actually an extension of our worship. It's not something we have to do, it's something that we get to do. It's a way we partner with Christ to bring the gospel to not only Plano, not only Kendall County, but beyond our, even our nation. And, uh, and you see that by uh, the people that, that tune in from, uh, from different states and from different areas of the country, that uh, this little church here has a reach well beyond its own community. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that all of you and, and those who are watching uh, have been generous and surrendered to Christ and said that we give this as an offering to Jesus. Not to some person up front, not to an institution, but to an actual mission that's bigger than us. So uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm inspired by your generosity. I'm inspired by your radical faith in Christ that says, yeah, even when it's uncomfortable, even when I feel like I don't have the money, even when I'm not sure how the rent's going to get paid or how the mortgage is going to get paid, even if my hand is shaking, I'm going to write that check and trust the Lord. And he's never let us down. And after almost 165 years, this church remains as a lighthouse for Christ because of generations of generous people. Uh, so let's pray for our offering. There, there's many ways that it comes in. It comes in on Sunday mornings. You can drop it off in the plate when service is over. You can give online at umcplano.org. And some people just drop it off. But let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for how you've worked in our lives, that you have motivated us to be generous, to give a portion of what you've given us back into the ministry so that until you return, this place, this ground, this land will continue to be a place where people can come and hear the gospel. That we remain steadfast in our spiritual growth and the empowerment to go share the gospel. It happens because your people have been generous. Thank you for that. Give us wisdom how to handle your financial resources that we are able to do with integrity, with honor, with an attitude of worship that your kingdom would be built because of the generosity of your people. Do this great work, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you want to join us in hymn number 539, Spirit of the Living God, we'll sing verses 1 and 2. Number 539, Spirit of the Living God, verse 1 and 2. Amen. So we're going to continue our series in the book of Galatians. Last Sunday we ended with uh, Paul's plea to us in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 that for freedom Christ has set us free. 
Stand firm, therefore, and do, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery or the bondage of slavery, being slave to what we've been set free from. He didn't set us free to continue to remain in bondage, but he set us free that we would actually live free. We pick up today, the sermon is freedom through Christ, don't go back to bondage. We'll be in Galatians 2 through chapter 9, or verse 9. Paul continues and says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of the righteous of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Verse 9 really spoke to me because uh, how many of you bake? Anybody here bake? I don't bake. I don't bake, but we know that if a little bit of leaven is in the bread, what happens? It rises. It rises. So even if there's just a little bit, it affects the whole loaf. Paul's saying here, look, if there's just a speck of heresy, if there's a speck of law, if there's a little bit of bondage left, it infects the whole body. For those of you who want to go back to the law, and for those of you who are considering it as your means of salvation or your means of growing closer to Christ, not only is he saying that you are wrong, but he's saying those of you who are perpetrating that are poisoning the whole loaf. You're poisoning the whole body. This is one of the first times that Paul begins to get emphatic. He begins to bring the point home. He spent the first four chapters pouring out his heart to the Galatians, sharing ministry with them, sharing stories of how he vehemently protected the gospel. But now he's starting to get adamant. He's starting to get a little angry and frustrated. People have come in. Now some commentators call them missionaries and say that they have an alternate view of salvation. And they're afraid that Paul is missing the point and some commentators think that these people that have come in and infiltrated the Galatian churches actually didn't mean to steer people away from Christ, but they wanted to make sure that they had all of Christ. But I don't think Paul buys that, and I don't think that's the case. They are purposely agitating and causing problems inside the body of Christ, falsely. They are forcing people or guilting people to go back into a yoke of slavery, thinking that somehow Christ and adherence to the law is a means of salvation or spiritual growth. And Paul begins to put the hammer down on this. I, Paul, say to you, if you accept circumcision, Christ is no advantage of you. That's a frightening statement. And he says a couple others that we're going to tackle here. This is a difficult passage of scripture to talk about. Because it sounds like we're losing our salvation. Or at least that we've fallen away from our relationship with Christ. He says, Christ is no advantage to you. So if you think that you're going to, to grow clo closer to Christ because you're going to do good works, you're going to try to fulfill the law in some way, Paul says you're already dead in the water. You're already lost. You've already fallen from grace. The grace that you had received, you've fallen away from. Because if you want to use law adherence to get into heaven, you have to follow 
every part of the law without varying. The whole reason Christ came was to fulfill the law so we didn't have to. I testify again to every man. Now, you know, normally I make it clear that uh, when God, when the Bible says brothers or man, he, he's speaking to men and women. There's certain contexts. Let me just say, this context here, he's speaking directly to men, although I'm sure the audience includes women. Um, but when he begins to talk about circumcision, he's talking about an act that had to be done in the Old Testament. So when he says, I testify again to every man, he's speaking directly to men, who accepts circumcision, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Okay, we covered that. Verse 4 is frightening. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified or rectified or be made righteous. By the law, you have fallen away from grace. That's a hard thing to, to say. And Paul does not choose his words frivolously. This it was written specifically, with specific words, with a specific agenda. He's trying to wake up the Galatians and say, look, you're, you're in a dangerous territory. You're renouncing your faith in Christ through saying, well, maybe if I adhere to the law, everything will be good. And what's happening is, is it's tearing apart the Galatian churches. It's not only that they've severed their relationship with Christ, but this leaven is now spreading through the Galatian churches. And Paul is getting frustrated that the churches that were once planted with the faith of Jesus Christ as their anchor is now being swayed away. He's not angry because he doesn't love them. He's angry because he does love them. He's frightened for their existence. He's asked us before. He's asked them, I wonder if I've wasted my time. I wonder if I've preached the gospel and tore out my heart to you that now you believe this lie. I wonder if I've wasted my time. And apparently, this was an insidious invasion into the Galatian churches. Whether it was good-hearted or they were purposely agitating Paul and trying to get the body to leave their belief in Christ, either way, it is fracturing the church. I needed a page holder. Verse 5. For through the Spirit... By faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. What he's saying is we live in this tension of the now and not yet. We know when Jesus came, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. But we also know the kingdom of God really isn't here yet. And that we haven't been made totally righteous yet because we won't be until we meet Christ in heaven. He's saying you who would be Rectified, You who would be made righteous think you're doing it through the law, but you're wrong. We hope and eagerly wait for righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. It's not loving to be part of fracturing the church. It's not loving to mislead people into a false gospel. It's not loving to throw little darts into the church. It's not loving to try to lead people into a new gospel or a new way of making it to heaven. He makes very clear none of what they're talking about means anything to Christ. Circumcision and uncircumcision accounts for, does not account for anything, but only faith working through love, which means that whatever we do needs to be motivated by love. Not our human style love, 
but a love that is radically given to us through Christ. Where we're not leading each other astray. Where we're having difficult conversations with one another without blowing up the church. Where we are encouraging one another in Christ. While we're, while, how we're being like David and Jonathan. Building up each other in the strength of the Lord. These agitators come in with a false gospel, begin leading people astray, and what happens? Paul says, you have fallen away from grace. You've already lost. You're already in trouble. You're getting rid of the faith that you hung on to, and what you're saying is, is that the horror that Jesus suffered on your behalf is now no longer any good. And that the only way to be connected through God is by some human action. But we know in the book of Genesis, God did away with that. For when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, and they were unclothed, they were making coverings for themselves out of leaves. Insufficient. We can't make spiritual covering on our own. God sacrificed some animals, made them clothes from animal skins and clothe them properly. But Paul says, if you want to go down this road, you've now severed yourself from Christ. And I, Some translations say you, you've been cut off or you've abandoned. Abandoned and severed, I think, are really powerful terms because cutting off something is like cutting off the end of a, of a bad cucumber. But when you've severed something, it's usually a traumatic experience. You guys all know that I like auto racing. We've seen many horrific accidents. People have lost limbs. And they never say, well, when the driver was impacted, his leg was cut off. No, they say it was severed or it was ripped off. What he's saying is now, you're making this dramatic traumatic separation from Christ possibly irreparable so you better be careful on your next steps whether you're gonna buy into this I need the law to complete my salvation he goes on to ask them you were running well who hindered you from obeying the truth this persuasion is not from him who calls you. It wasn't from Christ. He's saying, look, this dangerous path you're following, it's not from Jesus. And it's not even from us. This isn't the gospel we shared with you. This isn't the gospel you believed in. And if you've been following us on a, on a daily basis, we've been working through the book of 1 John. We completed 1 John this week. And 1 John and Paul in Galatians are very similar. Both churches had a faction trying to drive them away from the relationship with Christ and trying to get them to follow another way. And John says, you can't hate your brother or sister and be in God. You cannot walk in darkness and be in light. I think Paul would tell them, look, you cannot say you love God and want to go add something to the salvation he's offered you. You can't love God if you're trying to lead his people away from you. If you say you walk in light, but drive people away from the gospel, you are truly walking in darkness. He's pleading with them not to go back to this bondage of works-oriented salvation. He's driving the point home of the absolute importance of our understanding that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection, is enough. That we should put this to rest. And yet, you probably know many people who still struggle with, I haven't done enough to get to heaven. 
I believe there's a Jesus, I believe there's a God, but there's got to be something I can do. I need to earn it. Paul would say, allow the Holy Spirit to break you from that bondage. Freely accept Jesus' freedom that he purchased for you and for me. And I started to think about what, what does this actually have to do with us? Because none of you here, and probably nobody viewing us, ever wants to go back to works righteousness. To add something to Jesus to fulfill our salvation. So I think one of the things it is, is for us to have our assurance in Christ. And because there is no other way of salvation that we should be excited and boldly share at every opportunity the freedom that Christ can give people. I also think that in the middle of not only a fractured nation, but a fractured church, we ought to live by what John has taught us in 1 John and what Paul is talking about here. Now, what's fracturing the church is different than what's breaking up the body of Christ in our nation. But the bottom line is, is that we have to be working through faith in love. By faith, in love and a little bit of bitterness a little bit of hostility a little bit of anger goes a long way in rising the loaf of dissension in blowing up distraction in blowing up division Paul would tell us I believe that we need to check ourselves that the church of Jesus Christ has lost its way when it comes to discussion and communication. That we look just like our culture. We tear each other up. We cut each other down. We stop talking to one another. We get angry. We allow politics. We allow our own things to come in from outside and then penetrate how we interact with one another. And what happens? A watching world of non-Christians say, look at those hypocrites. They can't even love each other. Look how they talk to one another. Why would I have anything to do with them? Why would I... I live in a dysfunctional family. Why would I willingly join one? Paul is saying here, that the witness of Christ is being damaged because of these interlopers, because of these agitators. And these agitators have dropped in a little leaven, which has fractured the church. He's asking us today, myself included, to take a look inwardly and see where we're at. To make sure that we are not a part of fracturing the body. But that we are working by faith through love. Only Jesus brings that radical, life-changing love. And I got news for you. I don't have it. It's got to be Christ working in me. Without His radical love working in us, None of that is accomplished. So while Paul wrote this centuries ago, and it may not feel like it has context or connection for us today, I think it does because he's addressing a broken church. And Christ is the incredible master healer. He's not just the physical healer. He's the spiritual healer, and he is the one that reconciles relationship, not only between human beings and a loving God, but between human beings and his church. And I believe he's calling us to a greater ministry. As we begin to change how we view one another, and we love each other like the book of 1 John has called us to, that our hallmark won't be backbiting, argumentative, 
and hateful. But we will be known that we are Christians because of our love working by faith with one another. And then we can take that unconditional love to a broken and hurting world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we prepare our hearts for communion, we ask that you continue to do the work in us. When we read your word, we're asking that you penetrate us and ask us, where am I falling short? What difficult thing do I need to address in my life? I'm not worried about anybody else. But Lord, work in me. We ask that you forgive us. We ask that you help us to repent. And that you make us agents of change wherever we're at, that we would be your representatives wherever you place us. Cleanse us. Forgive us. Make us right with you that we can be right with one another. And then we can actually have a voice in community that people will listen to. And we're hoping it's your voice that you came and gave yourself to every single human being ever born. Let us do that, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, if you would like, in your hymnal, if you want to turn to page 15, I believe we'll be lined up then. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. <clears throat> and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, and free us. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth, in all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick. He fed the and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and made, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now this is different for us. Typically we have a loaf of bread where you can actually visualize the torture that Jesus' body went through. On the night on which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread 
gave thanks. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and sa- to eat, and said, Take this. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you, for, for the many, for forgiveness of sins. It is the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with each other and one with Christ and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 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 Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus left for us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this is how it will work. I'll say the body of Christ broken for you, then you can ingest the wafer on top of the cup. And then after that, I'll say the blood of Christ shed for you. You can peel back. The, the grape juice and drink it, and then the garbage can is here. You can drop it off as you leave. But brothers and sisters, the bread in which you are about to take is the body of Christ given for you. And the grape juice you're about to drink is the blood of Christ shed for you. Because we are one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of one loaf. The bread which we broke is the sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup that we gave thanks over is the sharing in his blood. Let's not let leaven infect the whole lump. Now, if you're able and you're able to stand and read, I invite you to stand for our closing hymn, which is number 159, Lift Up High the Cross, uh, the first verse. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ overwhelm you. 
May his passion fill you and may his grace strengthen you. Go today in peace in the name of the one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.